would speak. We hunger for his word. And Lord, I submit myself, I yield myself to be your vessel to speak your word in Jesus' name. Everybody say it. Amen. Amen. Well, good. So, you might want to open your Bible to begin with to 1 Peter chapter 2. It's, it's always interesting to reach into the Word and rely upon the Lord to speak. I wish it would be something that could, we could just patent it and make it so that we didn't have to reach in. But if you really want to walk with God, you have to reach in. How many know what I'm talking about? By the way, it's good to see Esther Cho with us this morning. Amen. Keep praying for Esther and Ministry of Sweet Jesus. Have you ever heard of a, isn't that a cool name? Ministry of Sweet Jesus. And that's their ministry. Uh, and Esther's here in the States with us for a while before she goes back to Korea. And uh, I really began asking myself some questions this morning. I think everything begins with the question, what you ask yourself. And one of the questions that I asked myself today was how can I be so connected to him that there's no separation between us? How can I be so connected to him that there's no separation between us? You know, that would really define oneness, wouldn't it? Oneness is where there's a joining together where there's no separation. And it really solves the identity problem when you get into oneness because now the one that you're one with, you're actually confused with. In other words, there's no distinction between the two. That's the depth of unity that the Lord desires that we have with him. And so I looked up, there's a couple of words that really stuck in my spirit the last two days. And one of them was cornerstone and the other one was perfection. Everybody say cornerstone and perfection. First Peter chapter two um, talks about the cornerstone. And verse four, coming to him as a living stone rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You are also living stones. Everybody say, I'm a living stone. So we're equated to be a stone, but it's not just the regular stone, it's actually a living stone. Now we know that stones are that which comprises the building of a structure. Another scripture tells us that we're being built into the temple of God. There's something about each one of us that God desires to be included in what he's doing. God includes you in his master plan. Are you happy about that? He didn't have to include us, but he chose to include us. He chose us but even before the foundation of the world to be a part of what he's going to do on the earth. In fact, he even goes so far as to say that we're joint heirs with him, that we've been brought together with him to this place. And everything that he did, he did it on our behalf so that we could have a pathway into the experience of who he is as part of the Godhead. So everything that he is, we're also becoming. And as the stones, we're individually hewn out of the mountain. But the, the individuality of our stone ship, everybody say, my stone ship. <laughs> How many are glad you have a, a, an individual stone ship? Our individual stone ship becomes part of something greater than what we could ever be as an individual. Because one stone out there, you know, you can look at a stone and you're not very impressed, right? But what about when you put all those stones together and you build a structure? It's something entirely different now than what it appeared to be just as a singular stone. So it means that we can never be and do just by ourselves. 
but we can be and do together. Everybody say, we're in this together. And so God's saying that I'm, I'm making you a stone, a living stone. You're being built up to be a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I, did we know that this morning when we came in here, that we're actually here offering up sacrifice? Did you know that sacrifice is part of the foundation of what God creates? And that takes you to the second word, cornerstone. A cornerstone is the stone, and we'll read more about that in the scripture in a second, but a cornerstone is the first stone that we set in the construction of a masonry foundation. It's important that the cornerstone be set because all other stones then will be set in reference to that stone. So that will determine then the, the, the entire structure and what it becomes simply by letting the cornerstone be pure. So the cornerstone is per perfect in its nature, right? Because if there's any imperfection in the cornerstone, the imperfection is gonna show in every other aspect of the building of the house. And so the Lord said, I'm making you a house built off the cornerstone. And now the sacrifice, the interesting thing about this cornerstone is that, that in ancient tradition, they would actually sacrifice an animal and pour the blood on the stone. And then in other instances, they would take the, the produce of the land and they would bury it underneath the stone representing the fruit of the people. Well, it's interesting in this context that Christ is our cornerstone and the stone that was laid, he laid first by the sacrifice that he made. So when, when you begin to see a construction of what God wants to bring forth in your life, it always is preceded by sacrifice. It says that we're coming to God to bring a sacrifice to him. Now we get confused on that some degree because we keep referring back to an Old Testament form of sacrifice. So we're not killing goats and bulls and whatever other animal we could conveniently catch in order to sacrifice. But the sacrifice is the offering that we bring from our own heart. See, when you enter into a relationship that becomes fruitful, it always requires of you to sacrifice into it. How many are here are married? You know that if you're gonna have any hope of any success in your marriage, it requires sacrifice. It requires giving into and sowing into that marriage. What you're doing when you sow a sacrifice, you're establishing, you're declaring that you're part of the cornerstone that's gonna create the finished product. So when you come into the house of God as a member of the house of God, when you bring your sacrifice to the house, then you say, I'm an equal contributor to what God wants to build here. You're not here just to receive, even though, thank God, that's a side benefit, right, of coming. We all receive. Aren't you glad you receive? But there's something even greater than receiving, and that's the ability to give. And to pour your life into the foundation that God is creating. Because then what you're creating is not only setting the stage for what God wants to do, but it's assuring, it's bringing an assurance that it will happen. Because no sacrifice, no gift will go unrewarded. When I think about my own life and reflect back on looking at David, you know, he doesn't look old. You know, I look at you, David, you look young. But that makes me feel good because David's 47 years old. Now, he doesn't look 47 to me, does he you? He looks about 27. And uh, 
Thank God he doesn't act 27. He, but uh, so David doesn't look old to me because there's a reflection because this is exactly how long we've been in ministry, 47 years, the same age as him. And so all these years um, are cumulative in the sense that it, we begin to build something that has a mark of his presence on it, mark of his glory. One of the comments that people make when they come into this house, and you know that uh, as packed out as we are, a lot of people make this comment. <laughs> when we come in here, there's such a presence of the Lord. There's the peace of God. There's the love of God. Well, that didn't happen simply because we opened the door and come on in. No, but there's been years of sacrifice. There's been sowing into the house. It might not always be manifested in the fruit that we see, but there's an underlying thing there that we can't take away from it. And so we know that one day that all that comes to fruition. So when you look at the sum total of your life, you never gauge each moment by moment and make an evaluation because each moment that you walk is not the sum total, but the, the moments you walk become the sum total of what you become and what's released in your life. So you make work all of your life in a given situation and you feel like there's little to show. But guarantee you this, if you've been faithful to sacrifice, there'll come a day of reckoning and a day of blessing to you and to, your, to those that are with you and to your generations behind you that come after you because of what you create. You see, when Christ came, he said he sacrificed himself and he became this cornerstone. He became this symbolic, not symbolic, but he became this picture of perfection. And that is where he begins to build the church is from the essence of his of the perfection that God put in him. When you look at the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, historically, you, you could become critical of it because you, it would seemingly not have the success that we think that it should have considering the author of its, the origin of how it started. When you look in the Bible and you read in the New Testament the accounts of all the great miracles and healings and all the things that happened there, then we compare that with what we see in the church today. Sometimes we feel like our, our situation is pretty anemic because all, all were healed. All the devils were cast out. All, all. And so we've found ourselves struggling to try to find this all. Oh, look, we've got to press in to find the all. No, we don't have to press in to find the all. We have to press into the stone that the builders rejected. We have to press into this pure thing. Let me read this in the scripture so it may become more clear to us. Offer up spiritual sacrifice separable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, is all contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. And he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. How many this morning can say, I am a believer? I am a believer. Say it. I am a believer. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, they become disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. But you are a chosen generation because you are the ones, you are the ones who believe that he is the precious son of God, the perfect one. You're not among those that are the disobedient ones that question and challenge, are you? You're the ones that honor 
the perfected one that came on your behalf to lay a stone for you to be transformed by. So you now are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Don't you just love it when the Lord speaks so nice about us? Amen. You are a holy nation. You are his own special people. You may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people, but now are the people of God who have obtained mercy, but now had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. Hallelujah. So this, this stone, it either becomes the life, the hope, the promise, or it becomes the offense. To those that are, that are counting it precious and obeying, it becomes life. To those that are disobedient, it becomes a rock of offense. Have you ever noticed how the Lord, have you ever felt sometimes the Lord has put a rock of offense in the midst of you? that confronts you. And it said it's a rock, you know, in, in another scripture, <laughs> it says that this rock, we fall on it or it falls on us and crushes us. How many would choose the former, not the latter? The former, you know, in case you're a little dense like me, the former is you fall on the rock, the latter is the rock falls on you and crushes you. You see, one thing about the Lord, there's no middle ground. We're either in this or we're out of it. There's no setting on the fence. There's no hoping that we can just skate through and never let God deal with the depths of our heart because the confrontation with God will come sooner or later. And it'll either be your voluntary submission or your involuntary rock falling on you. <laughs> so we don't pray, don't fall. we pray, rock, don't fall on me now. Let me run to the rock. Let me run to the stone. Let me run to this cornerstone, this place where the sacrifice was made and let me put my life on there so that out of that stone can come a living stone known as me to become part of something greater than what I could ever be. Hallelujah. Do you like it? Do you love it? Do you want some more of it? So be perfected means to be without flaw, to be without blemish, to be without any deviation. I know I was in Mickey's uh, optical shop the other day and I had my my uh, Brazilian sunglasses that have mirrors. You know, I'm trying to be cool. So he picks them up and he looks at them. Huh, there's a wave in your lens. What? There's, there's a wave in your lens. See, because he knows how to spot something that has a flaw in it. And the Lord's looking this morning and says, is there a wave? <laughs> is there an area of your heart that you're not letting God deal with? Is there bitterness? Is there resentment? Is there jealousy? Is there unforgiveness? Is there self-preservation? Is there pride? Is there a wave in your spirit that you haven't let God deal with yet. He's perfect. You know what it says? This kind of blows me up. He says, whew. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, whew. <laughs> it says Matthew 5, 48, therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. 
That's, I mean, I don't know about you, but that's expecting a little much. I mean, Lord, you know how imperfect I am. So now you're telling me to be perfect? You know, people translate that different ways. God says be perfect, so we start living a moral, clean life. We start watching what we say. We start watching what we do. And we, we are perfect. Doesn't work that way, does it? Because it said when you seek your own righteousness, you're going to wind up in frustration because there's no righteousness in you. Face it. We're as far from perfect as perfect is. It's kind of like Forrest Gump. Stupid is, stupid is, stupid is, stupid does. We're perfect is, perfect isn't. I mean, when you look at us and say, let's put them under the Mickey microscope and see if there's a wave in the lens, guess what he's going to find? Lots of waves. So how can we be perfect then as he's perfect? Well, where does perfection start in your life? What, what are you? You're a spirit. You're a soul. And hopefully you're in a body this morning. And to those that aren't in the body, we welcome the cloud of witnesses. <laughs> but when the perfection that he's speaking about is the perfection of your spirit. Now we know that, that God is a spirit. Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Right? So when the Lord sent his son Jesus Christ, when he when he the Lord birthed himself through the Virgin Mary and Jesus Christ, Jesus came forth, wasn't yet the Christ, but when Jesus came forth, the Son of God, he came forth with a natural body, a natural soul, and a supernatural spirit. What happens to you when you're born again? I said, unless a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So where, where does the born again thing take place in you? When you got born again, did all of a sudden your body get tingly and now you become Superman and no one can destroy this body? No. You're, did your soul, all of a sudden you get all of your emotions in control and in check and everything is peachy wonderful? No. What became born again? Your spirit. But the, the false assumption that really fouls us up is that we think that when we're born again, now we're perfect. And so we get all this feeling, oh my God, we've been born again, now we're perfect. And for about 24 hours, we're in this honeymoon period. <laughs> woo, 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 I mean, when you first get born again, it's like a newborn baby coming out and your eyes are wide, man. Look, I now, man, everything smells different, I sees different. Everybody's, I love everybody. I mean, this is awesome. And you're so giddy and excited. And you thought, man, I have arrived in utopia. And then after about 24 hours, 36 hours, two or three days or a week, sometimes people a month or two, sometimes a year, all of a sudden reality sets in. Here comes the old reactions. Here come the old thoughts. Here comes the old judgments, the unforgiveness, all these things come in and, and you say, I thought in Christ Jesus we were complete and when I got saved, everything would be right. And then you find out it's nothing right about it. And you become discouraged. I don't know how many hundreds of people I've seen in the last few years that come in and they're so fired up for God and I mean they're rolling around on the floor laughing like hyenas and jumping up and down and acting like they've just been hit with a double dose of the Holy Ghost and they have been and then six months later you never see them again and you hear about them and they're not going to church oh I'm just trying to find myself I, I'm just disillusioned 
And at one time you thought, man, this was the next great apostle. This was the next great prophetess of the Lord. And then all of a sudden they're gone. Why? Because they got, were taught that they were perfect the moment they got saved. They, did, they weren't taught that that was only the beginning of perfection. Because Jesus was the example, the cornerstone. Do you agree with that? Everybody say, Jesus is the example, the cornerstone. So let's look at Jesus. Would it be okay to look at Jesus for a minute? Okay, we'll try that. Jesus was born as a perfect man in his spirit, but yet he was not guaranteed the pathway of success unless he chose it. And every step of the way, he kept choosing to do the will of God. And it says in the scripture that when he was young, his awareness began to increase of who the father was. Why didn't he just get birthed and poof, here he's birthed, and now he's on the cross and everything changes. It took 30 years. It took him 30 years to get to the place of maturation. The maturity so that he could make the sacrifice. It said that he changed by the things he learned. He was a son of God, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So Christ himself went through this process of perfection. That's really amazing, isn't it? Why would Christ have to go through suffering, obedience, submission? Because here is God. Why would God do that? Because he was giving you the pattern. He said he's the first son that was born. The first, very first one was Jesus Christ. Thank God for Jesus. But it said now he's going to birth many sons to the same glory that he has with the Father. And it was in that process of maturity that he began to acquire a knowledge of who his father was and begin to understand the nature and the heart of God the Father. Amen? It's good. It, said, it says in Luke 2, 4, it said, and Jesus increased. Why, why would he have to increase? Didn't he already have it all? I mean, wasn't God in him? Wasn't his spirit perfect? Why did he have to increase? He said he increased in wisdom and stature and he increased in favor with God and with man. Let me tell you where you're at today is not where you're supposed to be tomorrow. God wants to give you a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of favor. He wants to increase the knowledge of who he is in your life. So you may be discouraged. Don't be discouraged because Jesus himself, it said, grew. He became strong in the spirit. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Amen? Wow. This man of perfection, this place of perfection that we're all moving into. I love this stuff. Look in, look in Philippians. Wow. Lord just birthed it in us this morning. Philippians chapter three. Let's look at Paul. Philippians chapter three. Now, I think I'm gonna read a lot of this. Would you like to read a lot of it? How many know how to read? Okay, we're gonna put this up. Philippians chapter three, verse one. Even Mickey knows how to read. Yeah, Philippians chapter one, chapter three, verse one. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is, is not tedious, but it's for your sake, safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. 
circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness, which is the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I've counted for loss for Christ. But indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is by God, from God, by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death, if by any means I may obtain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained, nor am I already perfected. But I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to as apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal. Everybody say, I'm pressing towards the goal. What's the goal? What's the goal? I press to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. This pr process of perfection. You know, and I keep praying and I keep asking, Lord, I don't ever want to see. You see, this is a test. You ready? If you ever see the threat without as your greatest problem, it is your problem. <laughs> if you ever see the greatest threat in your life is something that comes from outside of you, then that is your greatest problem. But let me tell you this. The greatest threat is never that which is without. The greatest threat is always that which is in me that has not yet conformed, conform, conformed to his image. No one is my enemy. The only enemy I face is the enemy of my own lack of compliance in my spirit to be perfected by him. I must be willing to subject myself to perfection. Like even Peter, it says, when you come into the Lord, get ready. There's going to be fiery trials come upon you. I know you don't like to hear about that, but it's the reality. Fiery trials will come against you. In other words, all of a sudden, every person you know will resist you, oppose you, and come against you in every situation, your bank account, Everything can just come and just become this great enemy. But really, that's, none of those things are your enemy. The only enemy that can defeat you is your own heart and your own response. The threat is always the threat within, not the threat without. Well, if it wasn't for my husband, if it wasn't for my wife, if it wasn't for the honored children, if it wasn't for them rebellious church members, then my life would be perfect. No, it wouldn't. There'd just be something else come. Someone else would come. Some other thing would come. As many times as you push it down, there's gonna be another one pop up until you face the fact that what God's trying to do is connect you like crazy into his heart, make you one with him so that you can go through this process of understanding and knowledge, this awareness of this oneness of God that he wants to create in you. So that when you are approached by any situation, out of you comes the essence, the fragrance of who he is. Lately, I've been hugging people a lot on Fridays. I always hug people a lot. And I've, I come to tears just about with everybody. Now, if you notice me and I don't come to tears with you, don't take it personal. 
because I can't just turn it on and turn it off. But, but I, I'm hugging people and I feel tears. I'm just not no weeping or nothing, but I'm just tears. And I'm thinking, Lord, maybe I'm loving them with the love of Jesus. Maybe I have the same heart for them that you have for them. Maybe I see them as this royal priesthood, this holy nation, this precious jewel that they are. Maybe I see this, the, how they've been cut out of a mountain and how challenging and difficult it was for them sometimes to be ripped out of the old to bring them into the new. And my heart just reaches in to, to embrace them. See, the great challenge we face is allowing and yielding to this perfect one that lives in us to flow through this imperfect vessel that we are. Understanding our imperfection. He doesn't let our imperfection interfere with his desire to be perfect through us. I let it interfere. Because if I've had bad thoughts or done bad things and treated people wrongly or whatever, then I come to someone, I'll, I'll, become, I'll come with trepidation. I'll come and say, oh, I don't really bless you because look what I am. No, I have to come to you. I have to come in the name of the Lord to let the perfect one speak through me, love through me, become through me. There's no one like Jesus revealing himself through you. My great conflict my greatest conflict is always striving to properly represent him to others. My goal is to reveal his nature to the world that I live in. That through me, they may see Christ. They may see him revealed. They may say, see him represented. See, and if I'm thinking about myself, my imperfection, I can never represent his perfection. I always let to have his perfection rule in my life. See, to become a connector, and that's what we are as connectors. We're connecting his spirit to the heart of someone. To become a connector, we must believe to become the fathers that have subjected ourselves to his will. We, we believe that everything that he is is conveyed through us. We at Austin Cathedral we're not here to build, build anything. We're here to become something to the world, a representation of his nature, an expression of his love. Philippians 2, and I'll close there. Uh, do you think I kind of got into you this morning a little bit, what I'm thinking? Boy, I, I fail so much at that. I'm, I'm getting all this revelation, and I'm thinking I'm just jumping up and down. And then I get in here, and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm not really conveying it. But I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> Amen. Right. Amen. Philippians 2, therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort, verse 1, of love. If any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. And let this mind be in you, 
which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Hallelujah. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Good. Amen. So Lord, help us to be those stones cut out of a mountain without hands that are eternally one with the cornerstone, the place of perfection that we keep going back to, knowing that within us dwelleth no perfection, but within him dwells all things, that the living Christ might be revealed to the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wouldn't it be nice to just be free all of a sudden from all of your junk? And all your worries and all your fear, all your anxiety, all your conflict, all your jealousy, all your strife, all your anger, wouldn't it be nice to be free from that? Well, you can be. Yeah, I know someday in the future. No, today. You can be free today. Cast all your cares upon the Lord. For his yoke is easy. His yoke is light. His burden is easy. So cast everything unto the Lord, and he will take it from you. You can change your focus in the moment of a twinkling of an eye. Where your life is just filled with all this conflict of concerning about yourself and what people are doing to you, what people are not doing for you, all your conflicted mind that just tries to figure out what kind of place you can find in this world, all that can just be gone that fast. And the Spirit of God can bring you into the place of fruitfulness and blessing like you've never known before. Wow. Yeah, it's too good to be true. Maybe it is, but it's true. Amen. You can have it with Christ. And you, and you got you to gotta let it happen. You got to say, Lord, I'm tired of this struggling out here by my own. I'm going to jump into the worship machine with you. And I'm going to let this stuff be purged out of my life once and for all. So that I quit living my life and all this conflicted emotional junk. Amen. So you can turn your focus away from you, turn your focus onto the Lord and become an effective emissary and ambassador for Christ. How can we be an ambassador for Christ if we're walking around like Linus with a blanket over our head, <laughs> choking half to death over our own problems? You, you, when you're like that, you're not even aware of the needs out there. You're not even aware of all the hurt that you could be healing people you could be touching, the people you could be proclaiming to, the people you could be releasing, when you're all consumed with your blanket of darkness. Amen. I'm preaching to myself. Give me a break. I'm not preaching at you. I just want to keep coming back to the cornerstone of perfection, that my spirit may be perfected I'm not going to let all this stuff I've gone through, and I've gone through plenty. How about you? I'm not going to let all that go to waste. Yeah. I'm going to say, Lord, all the pain and the suffering and the things I've gone through, let that be the lesson that creates in me this release of your presence. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Cast in all your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. 
So have this mind that was in Christ. Humble yourself. Submit yourself. Yield yourself. Give yourself. And then forget yourself. <laughs> Self, you no longer live in me, but Christ liveth in me. Amen. I'm no longer subject to the futility of this world, but now I'm subject to the law of liberty as I look into your wonderful face. Amen. Wow. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and I am lowly in heart. Hallelujah. Woo. Oh, I love it. Well, you guys are a great audience. You either were sitting there with rapt attention, or you were dumbfounded, or you were sleeping with your eyes open. I don't know, but <laughs> you all look good. Hallelujah. I've almost perfected that thing of sleeping with my eyes open. I didn't sleep too much last week, Cheryl, when you were preaching. Just... I feel so much better. That was a good message last week, by the way. It's called Do of Herman. I just want to say bye-bye self. Hello, everybody. Hello, who? Everybody. Hello, everybody, yeah. Yeah. Amen. That's it. Mickey probably has a confirmation too. <laughs> I just, I repent and I feel like I repent on behalf of everyone of just repent of being okay with separation and being okay with not stepping fully in. And so I just step fully in this morning and we just lay aside every hindrance and every sin and everything that we just said that's okay and we just we want to be fully inhabited people we want to be a fully inhabited people by the very grace of God um I was uh actually sharing a story with Darren a couple weeks ago about something that I came and talked to my my mom and my dad about and I was like hey if the born again part really is restoring us back to before the fall, to where the spirit comes and reconnects just like it did for Adam and Eve, like why does it sometimes not feel like I'm in the garden? And uh, my dad, I don't know, it kind of stumped him a little bit. And then uh, my mom says, she said, it's because we're not needed. And that, that really kind of hit home for me in, in what Papa Bill was talking about today and just talking about don't try to press in to the all. And I just saw that cornerstone being put in the corner of the place that has been landscaped for the church. And it's plumb, right? That's the important part. It's set, it's plumb at a 90 degree angle and it has to be, it has to be level. So while all the stones have been perfected and we have all been cut perfectly square, it's not that we're supposed to join and press into the stones that are floating around trying to find their way to the cornerstone, but press into that plumb line Press into that place that's been set and established and the foundation has been made so that you can line up perfectly plumb with the, the fullness and stature of Jesus Christ. Hey, I want to declare uh, bravery over everyone here. Um, that being up here in front of all of you is very stressful for me, but every time that I become more brave for God, it never backfires on me. Every time I offer to pray for someone, it never backfires on me. It, whether it's accepted or not, it is, in me at least, uh, it just drives me forward. And I want to just declare bravery over you. And even if you have one word, one small word, one saying to share in front of people and to give to